let's listen to the daily life of a network operator. This will be chaired by Thomas Lynch, senior network architect in charge of the constant of Constance Network uh, Department, and he was uh, uh, part of LACNIC. We have Jaime Olmos and Christian Cogitambo. Thomas, you have the floor. You can start the panel. Thank you. Well, the idea of this panel, uh, we, uh, um, uh, there was a call in uh, Lacknog and Christian Cogitambo and Jaime almost have sent us two topics for discuss, uh, for discussion today. And the idea is to see what happens in the trenches in, for a network operator. So we always have the same problems. And the the uh, problems are always the same. And the idea is to find points in common. You're going to see that they are very different uh, things, but we'll see what they have in common. And to invite the audience to make comments. So we're going to have, we're going to chair this. First, Christian is going to tell us about his case and then Jaime. So, Christian, you're invited to explain your case, please. Thank you, Tomas. My greetings to all the participants uh, connected to this panel. Today, I'm going to tell you the solution process to a problem of communication that we had uh, during. Uh, uh, um, it was this was a, a pilot that was using a GPON access network through uh, their. Um, until reaching the uh, router that acted as a, a DHCP relay. And there were two servers um, and that handled the authentication of the users. And here, in the configuration of the CPE, it had been decided that it would, would be MT, and they were going to use option 82 of DHCP version 4. So. Here, the problem is detected um, the, because uh, the client doesn't have uh, uh, internet. Um, and the troubleshooting process, uh, we reviewed the configuration and uh, analyzed the need for license and review the logs. And I, I was the router and switch administrator. We started to check uh, that the configurations were properly um, done and uh, we saw that uh, there were uh, i validated the configuration and after validating the configurations and making sure they were correct we started studying whether there were any limitations in software or hardware in the router so with the assistance of the vendors and afterwards after the troubleshooting we could detect that that the router the gcb relay was sending the discovery unicast packet to the server with option 82 uh, in a legal format. And we had two solutions. One was global and one was partial. The global was to request the vendor to apply a patch, to develop a patch, to apply it and to correct the behavior of the router. And this implied some time. So we had to find a partial solution that was asking the uh, people in charge of the service to see whether we could have some other vendor for the server to use it while the patch was being developed by the vendor. Once the patch was uh, developed and installed, and we saw that the behavior of the router was better, it improved, and as we see in the next slide, we can see here that in red you have the packet you see the lengths that are inconsistent even using uh, options that did not exist in uh, option 82 and uh, in 
after you will you, there were two options uh, in the server one is to send this as uh, it arrives in this case the server was sending the option 82 uh, empty that was uh, wrong excellent christian okay now let's welcome jaime so i know jaime that you tried to send me a new version i'm so sorry <laughs> so talk about this slide and correct me if i put it don't worry don't worry just a couple of uh, ad adjustments in the sketch thank you and thank you thomas and thank you christian for sharing that it's striking how to how uh, we combine these problems I'm, to, I'm going to talk about the situation that we experienced and that maybe many of you at a certain time went through it too we <clears throat> we'd always been attacked with the ddos attacks uh, targeting very peculiar services but in december we were relaxed it was a weekend evening and we received an attack that initially we didn't detect it as an attack we just started receiving a lot of reports of incidents of people that couldn't access the internet websites of uh, the university uh, for services such as the mail and uh, databases and so we started doubting as we were not at the university we don't have too many operators uh, engineer 724 uh, um, so when we want to access remotely to the uh, equipment this this we, we were unable to do that so we were worried so we sent an engineer to see what was going on the situation turned even more complex when we were unable to access even physically to the devices that you can see in the interconnection to the internet obviously there had been a collapse and almost absolutely i'm speaking of carrier class equipment that are have quite a capacity to process traffic but however the problem was not the equipment but uh, uh, the attacks uh, were coming from uh, eastern europe and china so as we identified things we started to capture traffic in uh, the um, um we we saw that this the firewalls were overburdened and we started to analyze the traffic and we saw that we were being especially attacked as we had never experienced how to stop this and uh, although we had little experience to solve it what we did was to sacrifice one of the isps through the bgp we identified the prefix the ipv4 uh, 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 prefix that was uh, being targeted by this botnet we invoked it on one hand and that was our solution and hence when it comes in we send it to an null interface and of course it went on all um early morning but um, as uh, as we had uh, multi-homing uh, it was very helpful to leave an isp free and as you may imagine that attacking 20 gigabits uh, that's quite a, a large attack and but just let me say something to finish we had never been threatened but some colleagues here at the university in our country had warned us that a week earlier they had been warned and they had been threatened that this ddos attack would happen so it didn't happen to them but it happened to us a week later so this is just uh, what we went through excellent excellent jaime i have thousands of technical questions for both but we are going to focus on the 
on uh, at the higher level. But how long did you did it take you to realize that you, that was specifically the problem? Because sometimes I see, I, I know I know what's happening. A is cannot communicate with B, but until I find which of the intermediate systems is failing, it takes some time. How long did it take you to realize? In my case, about five days. I could, uh, it was when I found two root causes. First of all, as it was an implementation, usually the vendors do not assign urgency. They do not consider that it's uh, urgent. They will consider that um, if, if there is an outage, that is considered by them as an emergency. So they they don't pay so much attention to that. And the second is that not always do you have access to all uh, the machines that uh, participate in the connection. And I was the switch and router administrator and for support and, uh, and revisions of other machines, such as the ISP server, I need to interact with other areas. And there, I, I, it's not under my control. Hmm. Jaime? Well, we, obviously, a university does not have the SLA, CLA um, level as a, a provider, but however, the universities depend a lot. Uh, in, in our case, it was not during the pandemic. If not, it would have been even more chaotic. We It took us, first of all, the uh, announcement was identified immediately. So there are ways we can be contacted indirectly and we identify problems ourselves. But it took us from the time that the engineer came and another group of people, it took us uh, uh, 30 minutes uh, to determine the problem. When you go through these situations that cannot be controlled, well, sometimes we have clashes and uh, one person in the team does something, but it took us about 30 minutes to see that we had something more important. What tools did we use? Well, our intruder detectors were collapsed, so they were not detecting anything, especially the firewall. So the first thing was uh, to, to do use the mirrors to identify um, the uh, patterns we had inside. And we determined the attack when we saw payloads of UDP that uh, were uh, I can't tell you the number, but um, we didn't see this. Um, so that that's the time that it took us to find it. And then an additional hour to plan because we started to try to adopt many actions to mitigate it. And it took us about an hour. Identificar y una hora más para para implementar una acción de corrección. Perfecto. Eh, tu caso, Jaime, es. Your eh, case, Jaime. Servicio fue inmediato. Is the service was affected right away, immediately. In your case, Christian, this five-day thing was this affected clients in production, or was it something new? This was a pilot. It affected the launching date for a service that is also critical. La siguiente pregunta es, the next question is, what also happens to me, I'm solving a problem and then you start getting all the questions, what's wrong, what's happening, it's not working, it's not working. So how did you explain the problem to your clients? Because your clients are your clients' clients, their bosses, their colleagues. How did you explain the problem and the solution to them? And how did you document this? In your case, Jaime, but also for the engineer who's there at 3 a.m. and he started at 11 p.m., he's half asleep. How did you document this? How did you explain this solution? Christian, you can start if you wish. Well, my boss, based on the evidence that the routers, the vendor's router was failing and the vendor was responsible for correcting this and for the patch. And the case of our clients, as implementers, which is the marketing area, 
this affected the timeline for the launching of this service. Now, in this case, no delay occurred because we did have some margin and also thanks to the partial solution that we found, which allowed us to continue providing that service. Regarding the provider, well, yes, we had to prepare the solution as soon as possible and you say 14 days, then they want to have the solution in five days time. And also, hopefully, the patch is a hot patch and not a mitigation. So this might affect maintenance or services. Regarding documentation, because this was an implementation, I view this case, this interaction, client, provider. I think this is useful to document the problems that come up with the different operators. So this patch helped an engineer at the other end of the world who had a similar problem. So he saved the troubleshooting stage. So the virus provider finally managed to solve the problem. Yes, yes, he created a patch. Okay. In the case of this operator, we had this problem and we have to bring about this change, but this was demand based. And this also is then included in the release notes of the software version. What about you, Jaime? Uh, what I'm going to tell is somehow funny, <laughs> as long as it's uh, feasible of being told. Well, when we were on site and trying to mitigate this, obviously the bosses always want to know what is happening. And if this is a problem that we have, if we don't have capacity to figure out a solution. So although my bosses, because no longer my bosses, these were IT people, they're not specialized in networking. So I recall that one of my bosses was saying, well, but this is what it's reporting. The thing is, is that there are millions of, of these in, in the mailing list when we're attacking something, we are informed by us. And then he said, well, report, you're reporting this to them. So I was telling him about all the origins that we had, and this couldn't be included in just one window because there were so many. And so there was a lot of uncertainty because in the past, we had never had such a high volume attack and we didn't have the expertise to see how we could mitigate this. So the solutions started to appear. We gradually decided to set aside the bosses because they put a lot of pressure on you. We have a university that works 24 seven. And because we were about to deliver all the grades and the exams, this somehow became a crisis. So when I'm the person responsible for the network operations center at the university and I was telling my colleagues so let, tell the bosses to let us work and this is how we managed to find the solution now how do we document this because this has happened in the past we documented it very well we have a process whereby through the best practices we have to leave a record about the problems that came up, explaining the best practices that we have to carry out. And we also had to clearly state the type of infrastructure required in order to continue protecting ourselves, because if this happened once, it can happen again. And a drop in the network leads to, uh, affects all the services, of course. It was likely a student who didn't like the grades he received. <laughs> he paid very, uh, he paid a high price for the botnet. So we're almost at the conclusions now. So what are the lessons learned or what did you modify in the systems, in the people, 
in your daily lives to have a more quiet life. Christian, well, to assume that it is always likely to find an issue in the software and the hardware in any implementation in any kind of service, you have that always latent. And we also learn from this interaction between the client and the provider, which is mutual assistance. As operators, we provide different services that can be used to detect problems in the provider's software. And that might also affect other operators. So it's like a win-win relationship other providers, sorry. And we also learned how to leave a gap in the projects, not to have very strict timelines because two hours, this involved two hours of correction and two hours of testing. When you look at the PowerPoint, everything seems to be much simpler. Nothing seems impossible for PowerPoint. Jaime, what about you? There are three points that I would like to mention. First of all, I think reason prevailed. Sometimes IT people uh, sort of idolize ourselves for many, for a long time. We want to have a multi homing redundant system. And I think it was very fortunate that this was allowed two years earlier. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to mitigate the attack. Now, what we learned along the way was initially we have to find secondary alternatives to be able to access the network remotely and to act more rapidly. So there are links that might be connected to a modem to access the consoles without having to move the 30 minutes time, obviously, is irritating for the institution. We have an institution that has 280,000 students. So the demand of the services is very, very high. Although we are not an ISP, but we are an ISP for our community. We have dedicated links to all the parts of the campus and none of the campus has internet on their own. They depend on our and us. And although this is a big region, they are all linked to us. And the other thing that we learned is to start to work on something that we had already discussed at the NOG, is to have probes that are smarter. The CDN, we shared this with you. This is something we shared with you in 2016. And these are tools that were in the prototype stage. And finally, at the moment, they were not there. But after this, we set up these probes and like good robots as they are could take actions. This is one of the things that we learn in, to, in order to unblock the traffic so that they would learn from the attack and then this would lead to some kind of control. Great, that's cool. Jorge, do we have any questions? We have no questions for the time being, but I do have a question. It's not in the Q&A, but I have a question. Let's see if they can help us. Now, it turns out that we're always looking forward to receiving information of what happens in the big companies, like the one we saw recently. Now, I'd like to ask the two members of the panel if you consider that documenting and sharing these experiences from an organization, whatever size, like ours, would be useful for other engineers, and if you shared these experiences previously. Well, yes, of course, sharing experiences is very useful, sharing and learning from others people's experiences is most helpful when you come across a similar situation in your own operations. There are many different types of services, 
fixed our mobile services and we can always learn from other operators experience in this case this was my first participation so it is always beneficial to have panels such as this in order to learn from the experiences that other people have in our case because this was a university in mexico so there's a very close collaboration with the IEs through QD, which is University Corporation for University Development, and another agency. We participate with them and share our problems so that third parties can learn from our experience. I'm also part of the CSERT of CUDI, and what we seek to obtain is to see if other universities have situations similar to the ones we had. We share things with one another, as from 2017, many of the participations we had did not conceal the situations that happened. We're not ashamed of that. We share this information so that the other universities could figure out a solution in the event of facing a situation similar to the ones we had. So all the universities, I think through CUGI, are sharing this information. And now we have a CSERT at national level for this aim. Christian Jaime, we have run out of time. I would like to thank you for your participation in this panel. I think this is something that we have to implement as from this LACNOG, Jorge was in charge of organizing this, so thank you very much.